So I'm no mathematician or physicist or even particularly good at numbers. Um, I'm a 25-year-old doctor who, like many of you, have had life dominated by numbers as age, then grades, then ranks, then scores. And even in my field of emergency medicine, where life and death are constantly in flux, numbers still dominate as lab values, as <coughs> scoring systems, as vital signs. What I've learned, though, is that while it's easy to let numbers define life, what we should be doing is letting life define numbers. So here's a story a life in numbers. So in this country, almost every life starts like this. You poop your first pampers, you say your first words, you take your first steps, and soon, one is the most important number of your life. First day of school, first friend, first crush. You get older, you get smarter, you get good grades, and soon your numbers look like this. SATs, GPAs. You guys take those numbers, you turn them into applications and interviews, you get into college. You kiss your parents goodbye, you leave home, and now you get a whole new set of numbers. Student ID number. Course load, and yes, another GPA. You read some Nietzsche, you have your quarter life crisis, you meet someone nice, who hey, also thinks you're nice. You guys get serious, and now together, you two look like this. A marriage license number. You get your mortgage, you buy your white picket fence, you have your 2.5 kids, you grow old, you get sick, you see a doctor, and at the end of the day, you look at someone in a white coat who only sees this. Numbers, lab values. Depressing? On a scale of one to 10, how does that make you feel? <laughs> so we are a society that is civilized, reasoned, sophisticated and one that has gotten exceedingly good at quantifying. Think about it. Actuaries assign dollar values to your lives. Professors assign grades to your intelligence. Society assigns age to your maturity. And in my job, I assign lab values to your symptoms. I listen to what ails you. I hear your deepest, darkest fears. I make you stare mortality in the face. And then I tell you what you really are. A potassium, a 6.1. A hemoglobin, a 4.6. Or a lactic, of 10.7. The problem with these numbers is that they oversimplify the complexity we have as people. People with unique and defining skill sets. People with thoughts and stories that traverse the confines of numbers. So how did I come to this conclusion? Well, that's a story of my numbers. So I was born in 1990, went to school at age four, went to grades K through 12, just like everyone else. My SAT was a 2300, my GPA a 3.9. I went to college where my student ID number was 2537875. But on a campus of 50,000, that really didn't let you stand out. So up to this point, we've covered nearly two decades of life, but you still don't really know anything about me. So let me tell you something about student 2537875. I loved Chipotle. Like, really loved Chipotle. Like, make your boyfriend jealous loved Chipotle. <laughs> and so on a whim, one late night in college, I wrote on this. An epic poem, an ode to Chipotle. Oh, burrito, so virile with savory delight, filled with joy and wonder, all comers it does unite. And then I sent it. And after pouring my heart and soul into this declaration for Chipotle, I got this back, a case number, in a generic, generic auto-reply email, which in the scheme of rejection letters is pretty much the post-it note of rejection letters. Until a few days later, this arrived a package full of Chipotle swag. And with it, 
a year's worth of free Chipotle. <laughs> so what stuck with me more than the freshman 15 from all those burritos was this. If you're given a number, it is your job to turn it into a story. Now at this point, I was still a little overwhelmed by a dominating feeling of ennui, the feeling that I was still just student 2537875. And as just student 2537875, I got good grades, mostly A's, a couple B's. I took the MCAT and got a perfectly average score. And then I took those numbers and I applied for medical schools. Medical schools I really had no business applying to with numbers like mine. Then I sat in front of a blinking, empty computer screen, wondering how in the world a single 400 word essay could possibly articulate my entire purpose in life. And then I sat and I thought, and I wrote, and I wrote, and I wrote. And I filled that blinking screen, and then I hit submit. And back came this, my submissions number. Seven digits that would determine my very life and the rest of my days. Until a few weeks later, interviews started to roll in. And with those interviews, a common theme, that my interviewers had been so touched by my admissions essay that they had invited me to meet the person behind those 400 words. And for the first time, I felt like I was seen as a person, not as a number. And soon after that, I was accepted to a top 20 medical school where I quickly signed on the dotted line and joined 240 others, most with numbers much better than mine. So you see, number after number, numbers were not really my forte. I was not so good at being a number. Numbers are a reference points. They are hardly an ends and rarely a means. And in isolation, numbers are functionally meaningless. Even in series, numbers just become bigger numbers. But letters, letters become words, which become sentences, which become stories, which become connection. Now, understanding this was one thing, but internalizing it was still another. Um, I spent the next few years in medical school still largely dominated by numbers, grades, ranks, scores. As third year medical students, we started working in the clinical wards. And that was when I started to understand the concept of life beyond numbers, how life wasn't defined by numbers and equations, but by quality. How to a cancer patient, a white blood count of 0 0.8 versus 0 0.9 didn't really mean anything to them. What did was whether or not they would live to see the birth of their grandchild. How calculating the acid-base equation of a patient's kidney function was the most important thing to my grade and my rotation, but to them, just making time to hold their hand and listen to their fears would have been infinitely more meaningful. And how when one, word, one person passes, it's not really just one. It's one mother, one wife, one friend, one daughter. It's an aggregate well beyond one. Now, at this point, I had come to these conclusions, and I was still a third year medical student trying to figure out life, trying to figure out career, trying to figure out a lot of things. But I knew that this was a key point that we needed to have as healthcare providers. So I wrote about these concepts into an advice email that I sent to the class of students a year under me. And upon encouragement by um, some friends, I submitted it to Kevin MD, a leading blog in medicine. And that published. And the moment that published, I got the first num number that I felt I earned that wasn't assigned to me. 6,200, the number of views I got on that piece which was written on my phone with two thumbs, but one heart. And from then, emails and comments and inquiries all rolled in from everyone like deans in the UK giving me accolades to high school students in Saudi Arabia providing, asking for guidance. So words are power, but that doesn't mean that the numbers don't keep coming. They do, but it's your job to make them your own. This was my NRMP number, a number assigned to me in the match 
which is a process that medical graduates get assigned into their first jobs at resident physicians. I took that number and I turned it into this, 180,000. The number of views I got on a piece I wrote for Forbes criticizing the NRMP, the very institution that provided me that number in the first place. And with that story and number came more stories and more numbers. 500,000 was the distribution of the Chicago Tribune when I wrote a piece for them on alcoholics in the emergency room and the duress I saw they had in the medical system practicing and working with them. A million was the viewership of the Today Show when they picked up a piece I wrote on gang violence in Chicago, seeing a lot of these people come in day in and day out at work and talking to them and trying to help them, but always being a little too late. And finally, 46 million was the network broadcast of the Discovery Channel when their producers picked me up from my writing and put me in one of their network broadcast series. So even though the numbers got bigger, they were still just numbers. But there is a story to these numbers, and that is why they are powerful. The story that derives these numbers, the stories that you can make of these numbers, and the stories you can change these numbers with. Whatever it is, you all have a story, and you can all make your own numbers. Thank you, guys. <laughs>